This is a message to all my supporters of this podcast. I'm introducing a new supporters program. You can contribute a small amount as a one-off payment to show your love for this podcast. Thank you in advance for all your contributions. This is the Absolute Business Mindset Podcast. This is created and hosted by Mark Haywood. I'm a corporate employee with an entrepreneurial mindset. This podcast will help and support you with our new ideas about business. These are my thoughts, ideas and comments. Today I'm talking to Richard Abbott about AI and business and tech. Hi everyone, this is the Absolute Business Mindset Podcast and I'm here with Richard Abbott. Hello, Hello. it's Richard Abbott here. Excellent. Yes. Yes. Um, just to give you a bit of a background, so, so Richard, I worked with Richard um, uh, a, a little while ago and uh, where he was a tester um, in our technology area of the business, um, we struck up a friendship, and um, I thought it'd be really interesting because Richard's got quite a lot of background within AI in the nineties, as well as a lot of different uh, understanding of business and industry and technology. So I'm going to talk to Richard today about some of his things that have happened in his career, um, and um, hopefully you'll get some benefit and you'll get some insight into different areas within technology um, and actually he's um, he's doing something very different now as he's uh, his sort of next career um, and we'll touch base on that as well um, so the first thing um, when I was doing my research on Richard I, I was I was surprised that we when you look through his his education uh, lots of maths um, uh, sort of qualifications were there um, and then um, took a very sideways step, it appears to me, to do a PhD in ancient languages. Um, so what was what was the inspiration between your education, i.e. In, in maths, but then why ancient languages for a PhD? Yeah, if you go back to the math side, I, I was one of those people who could just do maths, and I'm well aware that there are some people who just can't do maths, and, and um, there's a lot of debate goes on in education as to whether uh, some people actually can never grasp mathematical concepts or whether it's just a matter of appropriate teaching and finding the right teacher for the right pupil. I was one of those people who could do it. Um, So I went on from school into university um, and then into uh, ultimately a PhD in theoretical physics. But I was always at the mathematical end. I I couldn't do an experiment really to save my life. Uh, And the kind of theoretical physics I was involved with is... Uh, turns up in some of the most groundbreaking developments at the moment, things like early universe research, um, gravity. There's been a lot of um, scientific interest recently about uh, black hole pictures and that kind of stuff that um, uh, probably people have seen in the media around about this time. Um, However, I kind of got slightly, not disillusioned with that, because I enjoyed it, but... Um, I realised that within my lifetime I wasn't going to be able to build a Starship Enterprise warp drive or something like that. It felt very abstract. Um, And I wanted to be doing something that was much more hands-on, much more relevant, I suppose you could say, Um, which ultimately, just leaving aside the languages stuff for the moment, ultimately led me into IT as a career. I've been a developer, I've been a tester, um, worked with small teams and big teams and as an individual... Uh, And that, because of the AI that we're going to touch on later, that actually uses a lot of the same mathematical ideas and and formulae as the stuff I used to work on years ago. So there's a very, very interesting crossover between sort of early universe physics and AI research. So so I, I'm, I'm probably in the camp of the people that, that can't do maths as well as probably, <laughs> almost definitely as, as well as you could. Um, when, so, so it's interesting you were saying about, um, about maths. So do you think it is binary? It, it, it really is some people, uh, uh, brains are more geared towards understanding maths and being able to do maths rather than... Um, where I started with humanities, so that all my education has been in the humanities area rather than mathematical mathematics. I, I'm in the camp that says that actually anyone can learn it. Um, I've, friends of mine who I respect are in the opposite camp, and that's that's fine. I, I actually believe that a lot of it is to do with encountering the right kind of teacher for your learning style. Different right. people have different learning styles, yes. and I think if you approach somebody with 
the wrong kind of presentation for their learning style. Firstly, it's going to turn them off. They won't see it's useful or relevant. And secondly, they won't grasp it. And I think maths um, is, is one of those subjects that you can very easily turn people off. Uh, and you get very, very bright people who simply don't see the point of it. They don't see but, the but, but I, I think you make a really good point. So um, ways of learning is, is a really interesting concept because... Um, some people are doers, some people are readers, some people listen to things better, some people watch things better. Um, so you think, every, like, because I, I always think now that um, I can kind of learn anything. And if I have the right conditions, I would be able to learn anything. Um, but that's all probably within the sort of business arena, which is less theoretical. A lot of it is a pragmatic, you've got to be able to um, think through situations. But it, 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 are there similar processes, similar mindset that you need if you are going to succeed in maths? I, I think so. Um, maths itself is split into a sort of pure side and applied side. Pure maths is not my arena. Uh, again, I've got friends who, who lap it up, love it. I was always on the applied side. So for me, there has to be some kind of real world problem that the mathematics is addressing. Right. Um, some people just delight in it for its own sake and it becomes then a kind of art form rather than anything else um, for me maths was more of a language that you could use to address particular problems which right. is, we'll get onto languages in a moment yeah. Um, but yeah I, I, I had some experience um, coaching young people in maths a while ago and found that if w with particular people they needed to have an actual problem that made sense to them yeah. rather than sort of you know square on the high bottom use of the sum of the squares yeah. and that sort of thing if you said well look you know james bond has to throw a hand grenade into that corner of a room what angle does he do yeah so then you're actually learning angles and pythagoras yeah. and all that kind of stuff but in in a sort of gaming concept yeah so it's, it's, it's the context of, yeah, so of it context. so 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 if i was to learn uh do a degree in maths from my starting point you think if there was a if it was contextual and interest the context interested me there would be more um inspiration yes with mathematics i think right teacher right context um and like any subject there there are bits you've just got to kind of you know work through and they're difficult yeah um you know they're I, I, I found maths quite easy but nevertheless there were bits of math that i would say are profoundly hard and I used to get into, you know, having to read articles, and I thought this particular subject is one that I am never going to grasp. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, really? Okay. I can remember one particular physics paper written by some um, French women at one of the uh, senior French universities in, in Paris, and I read that paper must have been twenty times. I thought this is supremely good stuff. I am not going to get it. Right. Um, because they were a little bit too much on the pure side for me. I couldn't quite see how to connect it, how to join the dots. Um, other things look fantastic. So even within maths, there are, there are subject areas where I would say I, I couldn't go there. Okay. Uh, and other areas I could. Yeah, okay. Um, that's interesting. Uh, and, and, and so, so you, you, you grew up within the maths arena sort of, of education. And so did the PhD come, in, a, in ancient languages, come uh, at the same time or was that done at a late, no, late no, later no, no. stage? No, the, the maths PhD, the theoretical physics one, was at the sort of normal age when people do that sort of thing in the right. 20s. Yeah. Um, I had a long break then from academic life while I was doing other stuff. Um, had children, you know, spent a lot of time, as, as all parents do, on child-related activities. Yeah. Uh, they grew up, left home, did their own thing. Um, and then I wanted more intellectual... Uh, Content. I was in a job at the time that was um, that, that wasn't very intellectually stimulating. Okay. Um, uh, this is well before you and I knew each other, and so I undertook the the, the languages side, which is kind of mixture between languages and ancient history and right. literature. Yeah. So it was a kind of crossover PhD, um, and I did that part time as a distance learning student. So okay. it took me like about six years to finish. Right. Um, quite different model going in as a, as a, um, a mature student into a part-time learning situation yeah. um, it worked for me okay. um, and the the languages connection um, with languages both ancient and modern uh, I love finding out how they work right. why they're different why let's say Arabic or Chinese as a language works in a different way to French or English or German 
um, so different language families, mm. what I am desperately lazy about is vocabulary. Okay. So I, I love finding out how they tick, yeah. but um, you put me in that country and I struggle. Oh, so 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 if you so so do you think you could could you learn French, Spanish, or German relatively? Could you get by? Do you think with your I, language those knowledge? Three, yes. And but we something like Mandarin. Yeah, I did you... actually. There was a period in my life I was working with the Chinese team uh, oh. in, in IT uh, in the southern part of China. Loved the experience. Had a great time with them. Um, and anyone who's worked with Chinese IT teams will know that they have a huge emphasis on learning English. They have days in their office where they are only allowed to speak English, for right. example. Okay. Yep. Um, and you think, well, if, if we had that commitment here in the UK to learning languages, yep. where, let's say at, a, at a, you know, the office of a neighbour company, yep. we were only allowed to speak Arabic or only allowed to speak Chinese, you'd learn it pretty fast. And that's a really interesting, it's a really interesting point. There, there was someone who's joined our team uh, fairly recently from Brazil and she was given the example of learning English and so she learned English at school um, she then um, uh, what, what I hear uh, lots of people say she then started watching English TV or American TV and radio to pick up language yeah. that way and then she then did a, a full-blown English course but she was saying um, that even now, and, and with Brexit and things, that there, there might be differences happening, but still the language of business is always English, whether you're travelling to Hong Kong or, or Brazil or, 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 or Germany, um, if you're sitting with a global team, you will speak English. So we've both had experience of working with an Indian team, and they spoke all English. And, and to be honest, they're English was fantastic I, I think there's not a neither of us could say there was a, there was an issue but I think you're right there's there just isn't the commitment no. to languages no. in the UK and I think I, that's because it's lazy because a little bit of Bengali when I was working right. with Indian teams but never enough that I could communicate meaningfully about technical subjects right right but you could have a I could say hello how are you Not yeah yeah right right, right. One like that please <laughs> and so so you 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 spent quite a lot of time in academia yeah, I suppose so, yes. yes. Um, in two stints, two or three stints, yeah. depending on who. Yeah. Um, so moving on from there into uh, sort of um, conceptually, one of the things I, I, was, I was reading about you was that you you enjoy problem solving. Mm -hmm. Yes. And because I'm quite keen on talking to people about their skills and techniques that they use um, in business... What, how would you say you approach a problem or how should anyone that's listening to this approach a problem and be as efficient and as effective as they can be? We'll be back after a quick break. Hi, I'm Alex, the host of X Health Show. Meet the future of healthcare. Think X Men, that's X Health. Actual superheroes behind programming living cells to cure cancer once and for all. Tech that detects preterm delivery in seconds, brain computer interface, or apps that employ AI to match you, your disease, with the best treatment. X Health Show brings to you visionaries who push the boundaries of healthcare from Switzerland, the heart of Europe, and the most innovative innovative country in the world. Let me introduce you to their startups. Head to X Health Show, meet the future of healthcare. Happy to greet you there. I think there's a huge tendency in, in any area. You see it in IT, you should see it in business. Uh, I see it in my current role, which is within the context of a, a very practical family business, where people do something because they've always done it that way. Yes. So there's an inertia. Um, and part of problem solving is saying, why do we do that? What, what, what was the original motive that made this seem like the best solution? And maybe yeah. it was the best solution five years ago. Let, let's be charitable and assume it was. Mm. Um, why do people think that's still the good solution now? Well, partly it's inertia. Partly it's there's a vested interest of an organisation or of individuals within that, that they have a particular role which they like and they're comfortable with. Yeah. Um, Part of problem solving is actually before you ever get to writing a line of code or, or you know, appointing a person to a role, whatever is, is the, the, the action that you take, part of problem solving is saying, what are we actually trying to do and why are we doing it? And I, I suspect in any business, you and certainly in every computer program, you'll find 
a, a fair proportion of stuff that goes on because it made sense once and has never been removed. Right. I'll give you a very practical example about that. The um, One of the businesses, family businesses, I helped run as a guest house, and it had over the years all kinds of television technologies um, installed in it. Mm. We currently use streaming off Amazon Fire Sticks. Yeah. Fantastic, wonderful. A um, bit confusing for some people, but fundamentally it works. But when you looked at the outside of the house, there was this kind of almost a net of old TV cables <laughs> draped all over it. Yes. Which were dead yeah. because they weren't actually connected to anything, but nobody had gone through saying, we don't need this wire, let's cut it off. Yeah. And you find that with computer programs, that there's something which made sense, it was a piece of functionality that was required at one stage, yeah. became obsolete, but whoever did the coding took a kind of, well, we're not quite sure what it does, so we better leave it. Yeah. And so that idea of we better leave it puts then a, a burden of maintenance, a burden of understanding, a burden of testing, yeah. um, and in business sense, at all costs. So there's a cost associated with all this kind of dead functionality that you're dragging around. Um, often in, in programming circles, you'll hear that called technical debt. Yeah. Fundamentally, it's stuff that you no longer want, but has never been cleared up. Uh, so there's, there's a difference. So, so th- these sorts of examples are um, things which are, which are incredibly valuable because, there are, as I say, there's a lot of things in business, in technology, that, as you say, has been done for the last 10 years and it will continue to be done. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's wrong. Uh, and we should, um, we should be challenging ourselves um, throughout the, your, your development in a career or a business to, chari- to challenge the status quo because... Things change. People change. Uh, um, roles change. Uh, people leave. Um, regulations. regulations, exactly. Legislation and things change all the time. So th- we should be challenging ourselves. Uh, is it a mentality of um, it, if it isn't broken, let's not try and fix it? Do you think in most cases? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I understand that. And, and particularly from the business side, they're, they're being a, being a techie in in business companies, there's a continual tension between. Um, you know, the, the business side wanting things to cost less. So a new initiative, you know, someone will say, uh, it'll take you six weeks and 40 people. And the business will say, well, it has to do, be done in three weeks with only 10 people. And, you, you know, you have some horse trading, you come mm-hmm. up somewhere in the middle. Um, and it's kind of classic of a lot of technical departments that you know how much the business are going to knock off. So you inflate your figures a little bit. Yes. Um, so, yeah, we think it's actually going to take six weeks, but let's say 10. Yeah. You know, um, and then you end up at something that's reasonable. So there's definitely a cost pressure to say, right now, let's just do the minimum piece of work. And that, that's a theme I want to come back to later on as well. Um, but every choice like that... Um, ultimately ends up costing somewhere mm. because you're you're carrying along a body of code sometimes there are accidental interactions between things that you thought were separate but actually they're tied together because yeah. of some weird design choice that was made yeah um i'd say that and obviously i would i come from the technical side and, and i i'd like the technical solution to be good yeah and the, the business side typically wants the technical solution to be good enough yeah and that's the tension whether it's good enough or yeah. whether it's actually good um, problem solving I'd say half of it is that what, what do we a review to say what do we actually still need there, there was a trend, trend with software a while ago that you packed it full of features I remember having a lot of conversations with you and, and mm. uh, where we both used to work uh, about how things were feature heavy oh look I want a button that when I click it you know makes this pink button go blue yeah. or whatever yeah Nowadays, there's a trend to say, well, let's keep things very lean so that people are guided through a process of what they're doing yeah. and that what they can see on the screen is exactly and only what they need to do at that point of time. Mm. So there's a change in mentality about this. But often what you find is that all people have done is they've kind of reskinned the front end. They've changed the web page or the, the whatever it is, the dialogue yeah. box. Behind the scenes, all the code that used to do all that funky stuff is still there. Yeah, um, And that's... Uh, there's a potential risk you know you could end up with security risk you could end up with unexpected failures you could end up just with extra cost of testing so 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 so, because i i always think about um approaching a problem sometimes you're not even sure that it is a problem you 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 just approach a, a a situation and i think when with how you've described things is that 
it should be a constantly evolving process of making changes, reviewing, if it was talking about code, reviewing the code, tidying it up, because at six months down the line, you could find that something is impacted with this redundant code, which is still linked yeah. somewhere. And I think that's, um, that's a valid, a valid uh, thing that we've, we've all experienced. But what I, what I just want to just settle on this sort of problem solving piece is that's very specifically when people don't even know there is a problem. Mm. If someone knows there's a problem, yeah. i.e. it, from my side, from the business side, it could be a person, it could be an interaction, it could be um, something's wrong with a product that's, yeah. or a service. When you're approaching that where you actually know there's a problem, mm -hmm. is, is that harder? Because what you're challenging in the other scenario is the, the status quo and how we get that and keep on evolving yeah. and moving yeah. forward. But actually, when, you're, when you know that there is a problem... How how would how would you approach that? I I think it's a really interesting question. Uh, I remember somebody once saying to me that a technical problem can always be solved. You know, no matter how long it takes you to write the code or whatever it is. I mean, you can obviously think of examples. That's not quite true. But as a broad generalisation, mm -hmm. if it's a coding problem, somebody will solve it. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a human problem, then that can be very different. Um, you know, you get uh, all kinds of human interactions. Um, which are positive, negative, mixed, uh, varying through time. Um, I've had experience, I'm sure you have, of where, you know, we had, a, uh, this is a, it's an engineering firm I work with, we had a very big, very flourishing team, took on one new person, and it was kind of a disaster. They, they, they really didn't really want to do the work we were doing. They wanted a much more academic job, and in fact they left to go into an academic job after a while. Um, so they... They didn't really click with the team. They didn't integrate in a friendship sense. They were very, very good at their job. They could mm -hmm. knock out code. Um, some of their code was, in a sense, too clever. They were a great believer in writing clever, compact code, whereas I'm a great believer in writing boring, simple code that other people can understand. Mm -hmm. um, they, they were very flash with their coding, and it was excellent, but it didn't gel with the way the team was. Yes. And we had a lot of difficulties. Of how do we solve this problem? Mm -hmm. um, and as I say, in the end, the problem solved itself. This person went off into an academic job, which is what they wanted. Um, and we all kind of breathed again. Had that not happened, how would we have solved it? Well, I suppose I, it is easy with hindsight. My preference would have been to have found a different team, to have moved that person sideways. Right. Um, I, again, I know there's in, in business there's different mentalities. I, I've heard people um, adopt incredibly ruthless sort of uh, strategies. Yeah. You know, there's a person, let's get rid of them. And you have all kind of analogies about people in a rowboat with the oars going the wrong way and all this mm -hmm. kind of crazy stuff. Um, I, I am fundamentally optimistic about people's participation. And my normal reaction would be, how can we reintegrate that person? Right. Um, or how can we put them in a role, in a job position, or with a group of people that works rather than not working? Um, so I, I always see actually getting rid of the person as a kind of last resort. And yeah. a, sense of, a sense of sign of failure, really, if you have to get rid of someone. It is. And, and um, when I was in the business uh, around 08, 09, 07, 08, 09, um, there was a, an ambition uh, for a lot of companies to cut people. And when we had, so there was a, there was a deep recession that we went through for any of you younger folks. Um, and, um, and, and our business or when I was working there took the, the position of that we, we going to make a set redundancy and they, they, they did make people redundant. Um, but their ambition was always to keep as many people and, and being such a, a big, large corporation, they were able to move people to other parts of the business that flourish in recessions, that don't that don't flourish in, in, in the better times. And, and when you're in that fortunate position of working for a corporation, there is that ability to be able to move around, um, which I think is an advantage. I equally know some people that were in the building industry and they were told that they had to cut down to three days a week. So these were quantity surveyors 
Um, and these guys um, had mortgages, had families, and they were all told that, what would you prefer, to leave and try and find another job mm. or uh, work three days a week? Um, and I think anyone uh, who knows the the the, uh, the, the, the industry, uh, construction industry, knows that when... They, they are basically on the front line of recessions. Um, and, and so uh, they basically stop building when there's no money and it only picks up when the, when the better times come. So, so a lot of them took the three days a week and, and remortgaged and things like that, which was, which was the sensible um, idea. And I, I, I suppose, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the different roles you've had in the different industries that mm. you've worked in because um all the way from academia to, to to you said an engineering firm so in a way you've kind of so you worked for big four with me you kind of in a way reinvented yourself a little mm. bit in, in slightly different industries and different roles yes. there probably was a theme on testing and, and development but actually it actually takes quite a lot to to move from one industry and reinvent into a different industry. What was what, what were the motivations? How hard did you find it? Um, I think as as a developer slash tester is easier because you you the domain knowledge you have is of code, coding strategies, mm. styles, languages, mm. um, and a piece of code that's written in an engineering firm and in a finance firm look pretty much the same right you know i could drag it's the same language as c sharp or yeah, java right. etc you're right you know if i pulled out kind of you know 50 lines of code from what i wrote within aerospace and 50 within what i wrote in, in a big four context unless you knew the context i was written you would have a hard job telling which was which right um so for for somebody who's a technologist there is less of a problem right um, definitely, and I've enjoyed that. Now, I, I know people who've stayed in the same industry for decades. Um, I haven't. I've always moved around. Um, Culturally, do you find it different? Totally. Work? Yeah, totally. I would imagine it would be very different. Um, I moved... My my early IT work, um, well, my first IT job was for a very small firm on Paul High Street um, down in Dorset. Okay. Um, and basically, we just did software job shopping. Somebody needed a bit of work done, we did it, and we... we uh, and the, the guy who ran the firm built it up and was, was very, very successful. I've got a lot of admiration for him. Um, and he moved with the technology times and with the kind of demand that people were having. I'm absolutely convinced that if he's still running the company now, he will be into cloud computing and all the mm. other those mm. words of the day. Because he was always one who um, wanted to stay with where the leading edge was. Of right, right. Now, I went from there into AI work, um, trading on my maths background, um, which I loved, and I think we're going to yep, talk about, we are going to talk about, about it. Yep. Um, and then into aerospace, which was very closely connected, because the kind of aerospace... I, I, I never wrote systems that actually go on board planes. That's, mm. that's an extremely specialised and very, very mission-critical thing, where the standards for writing are extraordinarily high, and appropriately so. Mm. Um, I was in what they call third line, which is basically, your plane lands, what do you need to do to make sure it's OK to fly again? Okay, yeah. Um, so the, the kind of holy grail for all that is that as the plane is coming towards the runway, it's talking to a ground station which says, oh, I'm a bit low on oil and the, you know, the carburetor's knocking a bit or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, and as it taxes up to the thing, the engineers are already running out with the right tools and the right spare parts. Right. Refit it, off it goes again. So, so how, how would you... So you would... I'm just fascinated by how you would how you would code something that so what, there would be a point where it would make an assessment of what the the the, the plane was Basically, the status any of the plane at all civilian or military nowadays um, is every single component of that is instrumented and so you get kind of like certainly megabytes probably gigabytes of data from each and every flight right far too much for anybody to just sit and look through by eye so there are a lot of learning algorithms. So the right. AR came in again there yeah. to basically say, look, this pattern is a normal one. This this engine is behaving within normal parameters. That's fine. Mm. This one, on the other hand, there's a lot of vibration noise. Um, in our experience of the past, this means that um, the clutch is starting to fail. So was it was it a sort of flow chart for, for, for my yeah. simple simple mind? Did, was was it was it kind of like the the the, the logic that you were building was a flow chart? If it does. Uh, if if engine does this, it can either do A, B, or C, yeah. and then it goes to the next point sort and the of. next point. Um, we actually had a more 
kind of visual interface, if you imagine on your computer screen, let's say you had a picture of a plane, let's take the um, oh, Euro Typhoon, the Eurofighter Typhoon, which I now see regularly over the Lake District. Right. Um, so you'd have a picture of that, and then as the thing lands, you would basically get a colour-coded thing, you know, wings green, right aerodrome flap red, mm. port engine orange, oh, okay, engine right, green. right, yeah. Um, and that would also take into account all of the regulatory scheduled maintenances. So obviously right. with an aircraft, and particularly with a helicopter, where I also did some work, the, the requirements for routine scheduling are very, very strict. Yeah. You know, it's not like your car where you think, oh, maybe I'll do a service. And stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can't do that. You've got, you've got people's lives on, on, exactly. on a, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, all of that goes into it. And some of it is just regulatory scheduling. Mm. Some of it is analysing the signals that come off with vibration signals in particular are very, right. very thick. You could use that same kind of thing for um, for trains. I've worked on trains at one okay. stage for um, wind turbines, because a wind turbine is kind of like a propeller on its side. Yep. Um, and so that, that idea of analysing vibration traces to say, this is normal, this is abnormal. Right. And then what do I do about it if it's abnormal? Right. So decision support. Yeah. Um, I loved all that, uh, as you can probably tell. And I enjoyed working in engineering because there was a sense, in aerospace particularly, that you're working on something which you expect to last a lot of years. Mm -hmm. We worked on aircraft systems which were first flown in the 1950s. Okay. Were still flying, still Mm -hmm. qualified to fly. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you don't get many industries where a sort of 50, 60, 70-year-old item is still fit for for use. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I love that sense. And I knew people who'd worked on the same aircraft all their working life. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think I could have done it, but I admire them having done that. And then you get sort of like the the extreme end of that is you get the um, you know the NASA space probes that are now out you know Voyager one and two outside the solar system. Mm. Uh, I was reading the other day that they just turned on a particular attitude engine which has been dormant for thirty seven years. Wow. Unused yeah. for that whole time. Yeah. Sent it the signal, wake up, we need to do some manoeuvring. And it worked. Right. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Um, so engineering, yeah, I love that. Um, so just on that, so yes. so you've 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 so a lot of engineers are not math well, they are mathematicians, but they, they sort of the maths people kind of look down a little bit on the engineers sure. because yeah. they're not yeah. they're, they're sort of they're theoretical they're making, they're making, whatever, yeah. but this is the interesting <laughs> thing like because we yeah. were talking earlier about mathematics and context well actually yeah. engineering is the ideal yeah. mathematics with context because you've yes. got to build yeah. something or yeah. respond to something that's that, that that's, that's working so um i find that very interesting did, did the context help you yes. to, to, yeah. to love engineering yeah yeah and the flat you know as, as a kid you think, oh, wow, wouldn't it be nice because i remember as a child, seeing the um, the old uh, lightning aircraft taking off from Norfolk um, uh, air, airfields, mm. and now of course we've got the P thirty eight Lightning two, which I also did some software work on, um, which is a kind of stealth aircraft and vertical takeoff and worlds apart from that original Lightning, um, and yet obviously it works on fundamentally the same principles. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a thing that has to go up into the air and stay there safely and come down again. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, there was a sort of slight childhood kind of, oh, I'm fulfilling a childhood dream. Or something, <laughs> yeah. you know, well, we all had planes and cars yeah, on exactly, our walls, yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, having kind of dodgy eyesight, I, I realised at quite a young age I was never going to be a pilot. Um, <laughs> right. uh, so this was a kind of one step removed. I'm actually working on the planes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the bits that I'm very keen to talk about and I've deliberately kept it back a little bit because it's the bit that I, that really interests me is, is about the AI. So you, you worked on AI in around between 97 and 2001. Yeah. Um, so I'm fascinated to understand. Um, I think you've given me an in, insight before, but I'm fascinated to delve a little bit deeper. So AI in the nineties versus AI now, um, similar, different, uh, what are the differences? What are the similarities right. that we've got? Ninety-seven to two thousand and one was when I was with a, a small AI firm. Right. Um, did some work with Met Office for weather prediction and right. stuff like that, and then I actually carried on through the aerospace work. Um, so probably for another five, six, seven years after that was all actually AI work. Mm. Um, yeah. So in terms of, for, for buzzwords, in case people are familiar, I worked on neural networks. Um, both what they call supervised, which is where you you have a sense of what the answer is. So if you're 
training your system to re- to recognise digits one to one to to, to zero. Yep. Um, so one up to nine and zero. Um, so you say here's a pattern. This is a five. Here's a pattern. This is an eight, and so on. Uh, or unsupervised, where you're saying, well, I'm looking for things which are like each other, but I don't quite know what they are. Mm. So you often get that with um, health monitoring, for example, you know, this or machine health monitoring, the same thing. This is a normal pattern. This is an abnormal pattern. I don't quite know why it's abnormal yet, yeah. but it's out of the group yeah. on its own somewhere. Uh, so neural networks and also um, the thing called fuzzy logic, which I thought was brilliant um, and sadly has rather dropped out of favour now. Fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic was an attempt, rather than say things can be either true or false, mm. you give a confidence. You say, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure about this, or I'm very doubtful about that. Right. So it's a bit more of a kind of um, a grayscale, hence fuzzy, right. uh, yeah. rather than just yes or no. And also it attempted to deal with things like um, missing data or noisy data. We all know that in any system at all, business or, or engineering, the data you get is often questionable quality. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's a commercial problem. Lots of businesses face that with Definitely. data. And when you're trying to do things with data, if the data that's provided by the company is not very good, yeah. it's very hard to do a lot to do something substantial or do something yes. worthwhile with. So with fuzzy logic, you could say, I'm pretty sure that this number is right, but I'm very doubtful about this one. So it's interesting. So so um, something I've talked about is like user research. And in some of the scales, when you're asking questions, you can ask, are you very sure? Are yep. you sure? Neutral? Not sure, yep. but I'm yep. sure. Um, was it, is it that sort of scale that you, yeah, you'd sort of... it was really. So, so could, did it ever evolve into, like, I'm 70% sure this is right, I, 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 I'm 10% sure this is Probably right. Probably not that accurate. You're going to do qualitative things. Right. Like uncertain, quite yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, the other thing that we used Fuzzy Logic for was you know, where we got these situations, like I say, you have normal behaviour and then something out of the ordinary. Then Fuzzy Logic was a way of saying, well, can we understand why it's different? What's the, what's the driver that's pushing this thing out of the ordinary? Yeah. Um, uh, as I said, I didn't see much talk about fuzzy logic no. these days, which I think is a shame because I thought it was very cool. Um, so that was the, the the technical areas I worked on with AI. Um, how is it different now? Well, back in those days, you were mainly it was all desktop stuff. We had little networks, but you it was the very very early days of being able to actually do things on a network meaningfully. Yeah. So you basically you brought your data to your laptop or desktop, whatever yeah. it was. Yeah. You ran a program on your desktop mm. with the numbers, mm. so it might be a CSV file or Excel or mm. a database, whatever it is, but you had to bring it all onto your machine. Yeah. And, of course, you have a capacity problem. I had problems where you know, you, you'd be working on it, everything was fine, and then you'd run out of memory. Right. Game over. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that, that's what we, we touched on when we had this conversation um, separately is the capacity and the speed that we, yeah. that we now have in comparison yeah. is substantial. It is a huge yeah. difference, isn't it? So, for a start, your your so, laptop so, you've got. So, 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 sorry to cut across you. So, so are, we, are, are you saying that the actual AI has not necessarily changed? We'll come on to that. Right, okay. Um, the, 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 the real substantial difference is where it all happens. So the, the model now is that the data you're dealing with is typically huge. You know, we used to deal with the toy problem, the, the very traditional problem that's used in statistics and AI research, everything, mm-hmm. um, of classifying particular kinds of flowers, iris flowers, by right. certain measurements. And you have a data set of like 150 things, and, you know, and you, you split them up. And it's a good test bed for saying, is my new algorithm any better or any worse than someone else's previous one. Used a great deal for different things. And was that um, from photographs, or was that from no, actual no, measurements? From, measurements, from, from yeah, measurements, measurements right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. Um, anyone who's come across Fisher Iris problem will, will recognise all this. Okay. But typically in a real world problem, you may have hundreds of thousands, you may have tens of millions of points. You know, there's, there's the, um, uh, by reputation at least, the Chinese... Um, face recognition system which is dealing with billions of people now you cannot put that data on your desktop yeah so the the paradigm has shifted to you take the processing algorithm to the data yeah because your algorithm itself will probably be quite a modest program in terms of numbers of lines of code um 
it might be an applet or a database widget or something like that. Mm. But whatever it is, you take that processing and you put it where the data is because the data is the big thing. Yes. Um, so there are lots and lots of tools now where you can put your, you, you can, let's say you've got I know, a SQL Server database, whatever it is, and you can run your AI algorithm inside the database. Yeah. So you've immediately got processing power of a server scale machine rather than a, a desktop machine. And you're not moving data all the time over, you know, wires or wireless or whatever it might be. Yep. That's an enormous shift and has made possible um, a lot of the other spin-off developments from AI that have happened. Um, as regards the algorithms themselves, I mean, I see fundamentally many of the same names crop up. Oh, look, you know, there's a K-means one again. You know, all this kind of stuff. You think, oh, I remember that one. Mm. But being deployed into a different context so that it can do its work on vast data systems mm. rather than small ones. Mm. Uh, so something that's definitely changed, which again we'll move on to something I know you want to talk about later, is the, with the, the scale of data that we have and how we're able to deal with it, it means that we can deal with things like natural language processing, yep. um, which um, you, know, you, you could do in a very rudimentary sense years ago, but you couldn't do it very successfully. And now, as we all know, there are lots of kind of domestic devices which will do that yep. for you, which we're going to come back to later. Yep. So um, some of those have required new kinds of algorithm. Um, so you get um, probabilistic models, things called Markov processes, uh, which are you know deep maths. It's the kind of stuff I used in theoretical physics years ago. Um, I would need to brush up on it if I, <laughs> if I was actually working on that. Um, and I think one of the things that has come of fruition is the idea of um, kind of pre-built widgets that you can slot into place. Now, back in the, the 90s and the early 2000s, I worked on kind of frameworks, a little bit like any, any framework we have, like you're using GarageBand at the mm. minute, where you can drag and drop different components into mm. a workspace. Yeah. So we had it where you could drag a data source and a neural network and a processing module and a graph module, mm. connect them all up, with, you know, join the dots of the thing, where you go. Um, and that was, a lot of people were working on that. It was a very obvious idea to do. I think where that's come of fruition is that you can then say, right, I know I have my database or my, um, you know, my NoSQL data source, whatever it is, however big it is, and I have a neural network module or this module or that module, and I can, I can do the join the dots inside the database. Mm. Um, so it's the same kind of principle, but being leveraged in a very different way. Right. So so one of the things that a lot of people read about is when, when, when computers get trained to play chess and play Go and things like that. And that, that's something I, I know we'd sort of dumbing it down just for, for my benefit. But when, so the actual, the actual process of teaching through using AI, yeah. is, that, is that basically the same? Because the, the, the difference, it used to be huge databases of data and then you, you teach them how to play using that database. But now with the modern conception of AI, it's now it trains itself, it plays itself yeah. to work out what the different scenarios are in each of those different solutions. Is that is that substantially different or is it just it's used in a different way now? A bit of both, I think. Um, you, you basically get two kinds of intelligence system. One is where you, you train it in advance, you give it all of the training data and it does stuff, mm. learns patterns. Mm. And then you as it were, freeze it. You say, here's my trained system. I'm then going to use it. So I'm going to predict the number of, um, we must call them Boris bikes anymore, must we? but whatever the bikes are called in London yeah. these days, yeah. how many will I need on a particular day given the weather forecast, yeah. this and that and the other? Yeah. Um, I have trained my model on historical data. I'm going to use it on real data. Yeah. And normally you have within that a kind of review, let's say monthly or something. Is it still working? Is it up to date? Yeah. But fundamentally, you train a system and then you use it. The other kind of system is much more like our own intelligence, which is where it goes on learning. Yeah. So it's learned a pattern up to you know April the 26th. Mm. Some new data comes in. What can it do on April the 27th? And so on. Now, in the regulatory space, like aer aerospace, um, you know, when you look at the various aviation authorities, 
They don't like that second kind. Because what they want is to be to qualify a system, they need to know that it will produce essentially the same result given the same data. Mm. Now, a person doesn't do that. You know, tomorrow, you know, I, we, we, I made you a cup of tea earlier, you said, I have tea. Tomorrow you might say, I have coffee. Mm. The situation exactly the same, your preference has changed. Mm. As useless if you've got a system that is qualified on a safety level. So, um, the idea of a trained system which then is deployed appeals to regulatory bodies because they can then test it however they like, qualify on all kinds of weird and wonderful data and then say, yes, tick a box, it's passed, go off and use it. But that, that loses the human element. Yes, exactly. And it also means that if new, genuinely new situations come along that the system has not seen before, what's it going to do? Well, it's going to fall back to one of its actions, but mm. it's probably the wrong one. Mm. Uh, mm. Let's say you've trained your flight control system with up to 100 aircraft because that was, the, that was twice your capacity at one time. Yeah. And then five years go by and you think, gosh, I've got 150 aircraft. Mm. What is it going to do? And mm. really you don't know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, that's a very simple example, but you get the point that um, one of the characteristics of intelligence as we recognise it in people is that they can adapt to new situations, new yeah. data, new things that they hadn't expected yeah. um, and for that you need a some kind of AI, AI model that will go on learning yeah. ideally without forgetting what it has before yeah. um, there's an example we used to use, I, I worked on one of these models um, that if you imagine a, an infant mm. and you, you know, they, they drink liquid out of a feeding cup it has two handles, it has a little thing on the top and a little kind of tea thing that they drink through yeah. that is their conception of a cup yeah. Now, as they get older, it changes. Maybe it only has one handle instead of two. It doesn't have the thing on top, the safety yeah. cap. Yeah. Um, it might have a different pattern or a different shape. But something about that, they know it is still a cup. It's still right for drinking from. Yeah. Um, that's what you want of an AI system to say, well, okay, I have gone from my feeding cup through to my, you know, my uh, horn flagon or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. And I still know it's something I can drink from, yeah. rather than forgetting what you did before. And that's the real challenge with AI. How do you learn on without forgetting? And, and why, why is, it, is it, again, a storage? Like, why, why, is it, why, is it, why is it an issue to remember, for the, the AI system to remember what it did last week compared to what it does now? Well, supposing you've got your idea of what's normal. You've got a clustering algorithm, so we would say, and there are a number of different ones of that. And I have a cluster of, this is normal behaviour, this is abnormal behaviour. Yeah. Well, as time goes on, what happens? Do those clusters drift toward each other and become one? Do they fissure into separate ones? Um, do I still remember that what I thought at one stage was abnormal behaviour still is? Or has it somehow been lost in a bit of a mess of noise? Well, you make it, go into go into the, 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 the cap scenario. Yeah. Um, so when I was a child, I used, we call it a sippy cup, a sort of okay. cup with the, yeah. with the top on my children. You, I've stopped using, but they, you, you would use that. And then you would then, as you say, evolve into a cup, a beaker, a, 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 a tumbler, a glass, whatever. Now, when I was 20, no kids... Um, socialising that my my thought of a cup was very much a tea cup or a, or a pint Big glass. glass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now it's not until I was older and I had children that I actually then recognised again that sippy cups existed. Because in a way, I kind of had forgotten that they existed. Perhaps, but if I if someone had given you a drink in a sippy cup, you'd have known what it was. Yeah, yeah, what it was. Yeah, yeah. You might have thought this is a bit weird. What are they trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> But you wouldn't have thought, I don't know what this is for. Yes. You would, you would have recognised its purpose. Um, so in, in an AI... So, 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 the, so the Go scenario, the, yeah. the, the, the Chinese uh, game, so does, does the AI that learns how to play that extremely complicated game, will, uh, does, it, uh, does it have a finite knowledge base? Will it only understand it until it's switched? Or, or is there a storage that... Of those thousands different scenarios, it will at one point forget I, slash ignore or yeah, discard. I, I don't believe. I mean, in the old days, I, I used to write chess programs, and, and back in the day, we used to write them by trying to do kind of huge tree things of every possible move, and then mm. every possible next move, and every yeah. possible third move. 
and you very, very rapidly run out of space. Right. So the, the modern trend within gaming, as I understand it, is that you you look for patterns. You don't try and do exhaustive tree searches of every possible combination. Mm -hmm. And you quickly recognise that a particular strategy, a particular pattern, is a losing one. Right. So you, if you like, in terms of your tree, you chop off branches as early as you possibly can. Right. Um, now, I don't know in detail how, how those works, but I'd be... I'd be confident that it won't forget how to play Go unless you actually press the reset button. I mean, imagine it's got a reset button. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, it will it will maintain its knowledge. And each I, again, my, my suspicion is that each and every game it plays, it will in some way enhance its experience and think, oh, actually, that worked. Or hmm. the opponent did this that I wasn't expecting, and it was a really good move. But the interesting thing about the Go scenario is that it, it plays itself. It doesn't even play a database or, or or another person it actually yeah. it, it mimics two different players and two different scenarios yeah. that, that it that it that it plays against so um that in itself i, I i'm just fascinated so it's, it's understanding the different scenarios and, and as you say it's saying well in this scenario we're not going to no one would choose these three options there's yeah. another two options we'll yeah. process those two because that is the 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 preferred options of of, of an experienced person. So um, I, I I'm just I'm just interested. So about so is it a capacity thing? Are we still struggling, even though we now have gigabytes of of data that is yeah. available to us? Are we still in a situation where capacity and speed is an issue? Ultimately, yes, it will always be an issue. Um, the, the, the big arena at the moment, as I understand, having effectively shown that AI, chess and Go machines can beat human masters, mm. the big arena at the minute are, are the multiplayer online games. Right. Can an AI join in a multiplayer online game with thousands, tens of thousands, maybe millions of other players mm. and play a creditable game? Mm. Um, and as I understand it, that's where a lot of the interesting research is going on at the moment. Because then the the level of unpredictability yeah. and the possible you know, multiple interactions with different players and alliances and all the rest of it. Yeah. Whereas a one person against one person game, well, there are only two people. Yeah. You, they are always automatically the adversary. Yeah. Whereas in a, a, a multiplayer online game, mm. some will be your adversaries, some will be your allies. They might change roles. So yeah. It's a very different kind of problem. But again, talking about the, the the strategy for that. But that's just that's just thinking about how four people or six people would play rather than a one on one. Yes, but the possibilities for play expand hugely. hugely. Yeah. You know, do yeah. I want to make alliances with five of the six, and will yeah. they let me? Because yeah. that's up to them. Yeah. Um, I think too, if you look at a chess program, because it can't predict. No, it can't predict a exactly. human so, action no, because a human no. action. M is not necessarily rational or yeah. thought through or they might be instinctive. So, And again, with that situation, the computer has access only to very limited visibility of the whole. With chess or go, you can see the whole board. Yeah. In principle, you, you, can, you can enumerate everything that everyone can do. When you get into situations of uncertainty where there are, there's, if you like, a fog of war over the board and mm. you can only see your little corner, yeah. well, that's, an, uh, that's a hugely more difficult problem. Yeah. Um, because it's no longer a matter of listing possibilities, but a matter of speculating about potentials. Yes, yes. Uh, and that's part of the problem, from the point I want to make about the, the chess and Go programs. They are brilliant at playing chess or Go. They are useless at having a conversation. Yeah. And what the another part of AI research looks at is how can we make something which may not be brilliant at everything, or sorry, may not be brilliant at any one thing, but is pretty good at a broad range of tasks. Because that's what we expect of a person. Yes. We know that there are some people who are absolutely brilliant at X, yeah. Einstein or whatever. Yeah. But most people are tolerably good at a wide range of things. So it leads me on, because one of the things I did want to talk um, about AI, and I, we are going to move on, but um, well, slightly move on because we're going to talk about Alexa, but the, the, the idea that now uh, computers can make assessments in the medical arena... Mm -hmm. To be able to, I think, uh, uh, was it last year that, that they actually found a strand of cancer which hadn't been discovered before, and the sort of working out the diagnoses side is that is it, again is that just because the body is very complex, very complicated? Um, is is are we going to find that the computer will be 
in, it will be a lot better than a human in diagnosis or understanding of... I think the computer, in an ideal world, I mean, it depends how it's been programmed. You know, ultimately, the computers of today will just do what they're told. But a, a, a doctor, by reason of their medical training, will look for particular sets of symptoms or indicative facts or you know, things like that. Mm. Now, the when you run a bunch of medical data through an AI program, then you can code in medical knowledge. You can say, well, I know that a temperature of you know, 105 is pretty bad or whatever yep. it might be. Yep. Um, but equally, you can go in with a kind of blank slate and say, well, just look what happens here. Mm. Go in without any preconceptions of mm. what you're looking for. And it's that sort of situation where potentially an AI algorithm will say, well, oh, look, we never realised that, you know, twitching of the left foot was actually related to, I don't know, a seizure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guess what yeah. Happened. But um, things that are not anticipated and are not routinely communicated as part of our medical training. But because the, the body is an interconnected system and a very complex one, mm. I... I completely expect that there will be things like that where there are unexpected indicative symptoms that a dispassionate algorithm might flag up so so just on that so so i'm completely clear are we saying that a doctor of 30 years might approach a problem and with that 30 years experience might come to a diagnosis of a where a computer, because they don't have the bias of those 30 years, actually approaches the situation with a new, fresh outlook and and they would perform the diagnosis better than a, some, with a doctor of 30 years? Is that where we're at? That's where we, we might go to. But right now, the situation would be that if, if something like that was thrown up, if the computer said, you know, measure the twitching of the left foot then a lot of people would review that and say, well, is that an accidental find? Because you, you get things that are just a, a feature of limited data, yeah. like accidents of what you happen to have chosen. So if a computer does throw up things like that, then you can bet your life that you know, medical teams all over the world will assess that. And they'll either say, no, that was an accident of the input data, it's actually irrelevant, or, well, look, this is interesting, we haven't thought of doing that before. Yeah. And you could be either of those. Because... Some AI systems will be trained with a kind of some sort of knowledge of the the human body and its mm. normal and abnormal operation, mm. or they might not. Okay. And I think the trend is going to be to put as much prior information in there as possible, but aware that if you do that, you might be blinding yourself to things that we just don't know about. Mm. Mm. So it's it's very much a balancing act. And again, though the, the commercial um, trend. You know, you can bet your life that if an AI researcher had unlimited time and money, they would do it one way. If they're working in a business context where they're expected to do something within six months for a certain budget, yeah. they will do it slightly differently. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of, you know... So, so we've talked a lot about AI and, uh, and how the sort of theoretical side that we talk. I, I want to touch on something that I know is one of your passions of recent times is regarding Amazon Alexa. Yeah. Um, and I talked on a previous podcast that it's one of the uh, potential um, pieces of technology which um, could really change people's lives. So, so, um, so I want to talk about two things. What what do you do? What's what's what what? Just a bit of background um, for uh, understanding what the Alexa skills are, and then equally, I just want to talk a little bit about what you see the future for Alexa or Google Home or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah I, I'm going to talk about Amazon Alexa. It's the the system that I know best. But obviously, there is things like Google Home. There's uh, Apple. Have just Apple got Siri. Yeah. There's Cortana. Samsung have got the thing called Bixby that I don't know anyone uses, but it is there. It is there. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of these around, and there are a lot of um, very special purpose ones developed often by university departments that you can only access online and are not a domestic device. Right. Alexa has managed to get into um, a domestic or, or vehicle context um, staggeringly quickly. Um, I, I've been working on Amazon Alexa, what we call skills, for almost as long as they, it's been possible to work on them. And so skills are... Skills are like apps. If you imagine right. you've got a mobile, you've got a new mobile phone, it's got a certain amount of built-in functionality, 
like he could make phone calls for yeah. parish of thought. Um, but do we do we still do that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it can do this and do that. And then you can go to you know the App Store or the Play Store or whatever is your mm. chosen platform, and you can think, oh, I really want something which is a um, night sky planetarium. Okay, it's not part of my phone to start with, but I'm going to download it. I now have a dedicated piece of functionality yeah. which you don't have, yeah. perhaps. Um, and some of them are games, some of them are utilities, some of them are fun, some of them are stupid, whatever. Uh, an Alexa skill is, is like an app. So right. you get your, your new Amazon Dot or whatever it might be. Mm. You can immediately talk to it and say, you know, good morning, Alexa, and you get an answer. Um, what's the weather today? And if, if you input where you are, it will say the weather in North London is kind of, you know, pretty miserable. Great and cloudy. Great cloudy. Very, cloudy. <laughs> Very cloudy. Where are you seeing in England? Uh, so you get a certain amount of functionality built in, and quite a lot. Amazon have been quite generous with what you can just do out of the box. But then you can go off to a particular part of the Amazon site, um, and it's now in about 12 languages. I think they've just added um, various Spanish speaking countries. Okay. okay. Um, so uh, you can then add on these skills, and, and that's what I write. They're basically particular special purpose things. Um, I'm going to pick an example to be, to be concrete about it. Um, it's a space one because I kind of like space. Um, right now, NASA have a probe sitting on the Martian surface in an area, um, a, a plain area, as it were, rather than a mountainous one, mm. which is taking all kinds of measurements. And in particular, it's sending back um, weather reports. Right. Now, NASA, being generous, have made this data feed available as a public data feed. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool to build an Alexa skill which then will read the current last, I think it's 10 days or 7 days data. Mm. Um, so you can say, Alexa, what's the weather on Mars right now? Well, it's minus 50 degrees centigrade, <laughs> the wind speed is this, and you know, the pressure is whatever, and it's winter time. I think, okay, fine. <laughs> A little bit different from North London. Um, so, now that's not something you get an Alexa out of the box. It's something that not many people would be interested in, potentially. But it's a you have a, a publicly available data source, yeah. which NASA deploy into a web page. I happen to have taken that same data source and deployed it into an Alexa skill. Right. Um, of course, I'm vulnerable to that. If NASA shut off the data source or if they change the way it's formatted, then yeah. my skill stops working. But yeah. that, that's a maintenance job. It's a testing job. Um, so then anybody who wishes can um, enable that skill for free. I don't charge for any of uh, that stuff. Some, some people do. Um, it's just a matter of, of what you're doing. I do it as a fun hobby, so I don't charge for it. Um, and it's like an app on your phone, except it's something you speak with yeah. rather than anything else. And you get answered in Alexa's voice. I, I've only done it in English speaking, but if I'd done the translation into Spanish, you could ask Alexa in Spanish, what's the weather on Mars? And I'm right. not even going to guess what that is. Um, and Alexa would reply in Spanish. Now, the beauty of the system from my point of view is that I do not have to do any work at all on the language comprehension. All of that is done by Amazon's cloud systems in, in what often goes by the name of a data lake. <laughs> where basically they have stored umpteen gigabytes, probably much bigger than that even, whatever the scale of data is, of speech patterns. Okay. So that when I say, Alexa, open Martian weather, and you say it, and somebody in India says it, and somebody in Canada says it, that data lake recognises what's being said and opens the right thing. So does that mean that... Um, uh accents so the geordie accent or the mancunian or yeah. even the californian accent yeah. they alexa is able to use all good. those the, those good. different so it, so <clears throat> so let me just think so so i'm going to i'm going to offend a lot of people in the uk <laughs> but let's just say the geordie accent that does have slightly different words slightly different meanings for for yeah. words if if a, if someone in Newcastle was asking for the temperature or the weather on Mars, but using slightly different, is it flexible enough? To some degree, there's there's an envelope. You don't have to use the exact same words because okay. it's intelligent enough to recognise an envelope around them. On the other hand, um, you stray too far from it, then Alex will say, "I'm sorry." I just don't understand. Yeah, which, which which when it first came out was incredibly frustrating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and actually, that was so. So one of the things that I think Google has a strength on is that it uses its search engine. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I've actually got both. I actually ended up getting myself a little Google Home as well. And that's what I, that's what I found initially with the Alexa was that you'd ask it something and yeah. it didn't have the, the, the skill available. Yeah. Um, that's improved, yeah. is improving all the time. Yeah. But what Google Home did actually have straight away was, if I want to know, I don't know, I remember asking um, Alexa, however long ago it was, about the the Six Nations rugby. Oh, right. yeah. And it really struggled because yeah. it didn't know when the fixtures were yeah. or yeah. who'd played who. Yeah. Um, now, they've probably got that for... They've sure. just finished in February. I'm sure they've probably got that now. But you went to Google Home and you said to it, who's playing next Saturday in the Six Nations? Yeah. And it would be able to reel it off. So... Um, I'm sure Alexa or Amazon will, will get yeah. better at that yeah. and will increase its, its knowledge. Some of the most frustrating things is to do with music. There, there's a very funny YouTube video of, um, which is kind of replaying the, the, the scene from 2001 where Dave Bowman yes. is outside the ship trying to get back yes. through the doors. Yes. And, you know, Alexa says, oh, I've got some music by the door. <laughs> uh, it's, it's hilarious. I love it. Um, it's undoubtedly true that at the moment the recognition is not as contextual. Mm. Now, there are a number of very interesting decisions as to why that's the case. Um, Amazon did not want their system to be too spooky. I know every now and again you get these things, and oh, Amazon, they like to spoke to me in the voice of my dead sister or whatever, you know, whatever. Um, but Amazon made a deliberate choice to not be too spooky. Um, so, therefore, by and large, different things you say to Alexa are completely disjoint from each other. So if you say, uh, Alexa, watch the Six Nations, and Alexa will say, it's a rugby game between whatever countries. Yeah. Then if you say, who's playing next Saturday? Mm. Now, a person would have no difficulty at all in saying, oh, England, Ireland, yeah. because they would know that that was the context. Yeah. Alexa does not retain that context by right. default. So if you say, who's playing next Saturday? Alexa will probably say, I don't understand what you're saying. But the interesting thing, the great thing about which I've found about Alexa is, so um, one of my favourite um, artists, some people will know, some people will think, who the hell is this? Is Frank Turner. And I will say to it, check it out if you, if you don't know, you might like it. Um, it you would say, can you play my favourite song mm-hmm. by Frank Turner or favourite album by Frank Turner? Yeah. And it is able to yes. contextualise, understand yes. you've played this number, this song, this number of times. This is obviously your favourite. I assume yeah. that's how they yeah. they do it. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so in that sense, that's yeah. actually using sort yes. of greater intelligence rather than yeah. just that's a, using information that it's stored about your preferences over time. Right. Uh, I remember a, a mutual colleague of ours. His, his daughter was playing some music, and um, our mutual friend said, "Alexa, that's crap." <laughs> if we're allowed to use that word on the podcast. And, it's done um, now. <laughs> Alexa said, I've recorded your preference about this music. <laughs> um, so, and then went on playing it anyway. So, um, so that is stored as part of your profile. Where it lacks context is, you know, if, if, I, have a, if I have a conversation with you and we're talking about podcasts and then I go off, make a cup of coffee, come back 10 minutes later, I say, when will it go out? You have no difficulty in picking yeah. up where we left off and saying next Tuesday or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. You do that with Alexa and the context is lost. Now, within the context of a skill, that context is retained all the time. So Alexa will know within the skill, if, if you've programmed it right, mm. what you've said, what you haven't said, which bits you've heard, what you haven't heard, maybe mm. suggest, you know, you haven't heard about this yet. Mm. Once the skill ends... Is up to the programmer how much is retained for the next run. Oh, right, okay. So okay. you can do something where somebody goes back to the skill the next day and Alexa will say, Oh, welcome back. You asked me yesterday about this. Mm-hmm. Or not. It's up to right. the programmer. The programmer right. might have been lazy and thought, oh, you know, it's who cares? too short, who yeah. cares? In which case, Alexa will say, Yes, here's the skill. Yeah. It's entirely up to the programmer. And this, for me, is the exciting thing about Alexa, that you get these parts that Amazon provides for free, all the voice recognition. I do not have to try and understand Geordie accents and yeah. you know um, New Delhi accents and all the rest of it. I just send off the thing and say, this is what somebody has said. What do I think they're trying to ask me? Mm. Having got that, what, what we call the uh, intent... So what the person says is the utterance. What come what um, what the cloud system decides it means is the intent. Yeah. Obviously, you might get it wrong. Might get it right. But with the intent, my programming is then responsible for saying how am I going to respond to that? Am I going to respond to say yes, the temperature on Mars is minus fifty degrees, or am I going to say get back to work, you lazy slacker? 
you know, I mean, <laughs> I could do either. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, that's up to me. So bits of the program are entirely under my control. Yeah. And bits of it are provided totally for free. And it's exactly yeah. the same with Siri and all the others. Yeah, yeah. Um, it makes it, for me, an extremely exciting field to work in because I don't have to worry about the bits that are really boring. Right. You know, fundamentally, storing shed loads of data of different people saying the same thing is really boring. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to have to do that. Yeah, yeah. I want to do the exciting bit of saying, let's look up the temperature. Or right. Might be. Yeah. So, so, so what, what do you see the future for these consumer-led um, or consumer-based um, AI, so Alexa and Siri, etc.? The, the big thing that everybody wants until they experience it is for Alexa Mark II to be able to join in a conversation as a person would. Let's say that you, you know, you and your wife and your two kids, whatever, sitting around a table, then as part of the conversation, any one of the four of you might be silent for a while and then say something for a while. Yeah. At the moment, with Alexa, it's very much, it's like the old Star Trek model computer. Will you do this? Yes. yes, And then the computer leaps into life and says, you know, um, not till next week, Captain. Um, so what Alexa cannot do deliberately by Amazon's choice is preemptively join in something. Okay. It's a really quite spooky. It needs to be triggered by, be by triggered the keyword. By the keyword. Yeah. Now people find it quite spooky when all of a sudden, um, Alexa thinks that well, she's heard the keyword. We're, we're going to have problems if yeah. anyone's actually listened to this, uh, uh, <laughs> and then they're, they're listening to it on their phone or, or wherever, and they they get very close to to Alexa, Indeed, and yes. we've we've completely ruined their <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> I'm very careful to uh, mute the ones that I've got here. Um, uh, so yeah, so. Um, what, what Amazon have turned off is what we call push notifications. If you think yeah. on your phone, you get those little tray icons up at the yeah. top of your phone. This is on, on an Android, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, Apple, yeah, yeah. Um, which tell you that an email has arrived mm. or an alarm has gone off. Yeah. It's up to you then if you respond to that push notification or not. Yeah. Alexa does not have that. So I cannot, with an Alexa skill, wake up... Um, my Martian weather skill specifically at 10.40 tomorrow morning and say, hey, Mark, the weather on Mars today is blah, 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 blah. Um, obviously, a, an Amazon dot can set alarms, but you can't tie those into a skill. And Amazon have done that to avoid the, the semblance that Alexa is kind of snooping on people. Yes. However, for AI to become really integrated into a domestic um, place, it will have to happen. Because otherwise... Oh, really? Okay. Otherwise, you've got this, you know, you, you, when you're talking with your family, you don't say, you know, wife, tell me where are you going tomorrow yes, morning. Yes. You just say, where are you going tomorrow morning? Yes. Um, so you don't have to use those trigger words, uh, unless you're, you know, when your children's being naughty or something. <laughs> um, so the fact that we have to use those trigger words signals the fact that Alexa is not clever enough to understand when to, she needs when to, speak, to enter. When to when, right, right. And it's that understanding of when to participate and when not to that is missing from all these systems. Okay. Um, and I think if that could be cracked, and I'm absolutely convinced people are working on it, right. that would be a big step forward because then, then Alexa or whatever the next generation is becomes a colleague. Yeah. Um, so. Or a member of the family. Or a member of the family. So in the work yeah. context, just to bring us back to work. You can easily imagine. You know, so one of the things I, I was asked when I was um, at, at uh, my former place of work is, could we have something that you know we all know that you're supposed to get up every hour from your workplace and yeah. around and yeah, yeah. whatever? Could we have something where Alexa would say, "Mark, you haven't got up out of your chair for an hour and a half. It's mm. about time you did that." Mm. And the answer is, right now, no, you can't, because that's a push notification. Right. Um, and yet, for this person to be an actual intelligent assistant, you want that. As well as saying things like, um, oh, you did say that you were going to ring Fred tomorrow mm. um, or today, whenever it was. So all those kind of remindery things, which a phone can do really, really well, yeah. Alexa can't do, yeah. and, and the other similar technologies. So to be a, a real assistant in the workplace or in the domestic space, yeah. you have to have that. Yeah. And to overcome the barrier kind of... Oh, you know, why is she joining the conversation? But it's interesting the whole the whole sort of chatbot, which has sort of gone into lots of different industries, like, like travel and banking and whatever. Yeah. That that's always triggered by you entering the website or you entering yes. the system. So yes. always there's a there is a trigger movement yeah. of 
I need you to answer my question now. You and that's going to be quite difficult for... Yeah. for you the... get a little bit more flexibility with that because you can, if there's, let's say, suppose someone's been staring at the page for two minutes, then your chatbot has the liberty to say, I wonder if you're stuck trying to find something. Mm-hmm. Can I help you? This is yeah. what I can do. So yeah. the chatbot can intervene a little bit, but you're absolutely right. The chatbot fundamentally is linked to you going to the page, yeah. whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, but it has a little bit more flexibility than, than Alexa in the sense of being able to respond to delays yeah. or to, you know, you click three times in different places, you know, what is it you're trying to do? Can I help mm-hmm. you? Um, chatbots have a little bit more flexibility, but still not very much. Yeah. Some of that is it's, it's hard to program. It's, it's time-consuming to program. Yeah. Okay. Um, my last question, which I just want to talk to you about, is so you, you made a, a choice, um, you can go into as much detail as you like, about moving... Uh, to the Lake District mm. for uh, for initially a year to work with your son um, and his businesses. So, um, how's that going? Are you, are you finding it, it must be a real different challenge. It is, yeah. I mean, you mentioned earlier about me working in lots of industries. I, I, I worked in engineering, as we talked about. I then worked in various financial services um, where, speaking frankly, there isn't the same commitment to long-term quality um, it was quite a shock to me going into my first job in finance where there was the expectation that a bit of software might last a year if you're really lucky and there was an expectation you would then throw it away and start again. I'm mm. thinking, what, a year? A year is nothing. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, finance I always found a, a slightly strange environment for a techie because the, the, the goals and the, the priorities are quite different from those that you adopt as a technical person yeah and so there's there's more of a culture clash there yeah um so yeah at the moment there's, there's family business which has got several different components um i'm committed there for a year um if it continues to go well then i'm committed there for longer uh and basically my role is i i, I kind of laugh about it and say it's still a qa role i do do some it i do a lot of um technical support for our various systems um i do some Alexa skills um but they're all focused around tourism in Cumbria or things that are related, all that fun things like weather on Mars. We, we, we don't yet have a Martian part of the business. Um, although if Elon Musk has his way, then... <laughs> then uh, maybe that is the future, yeah. <laughs> um, but also a lot of very practical stuff like uh, we were mentioning before, before we started this podcast, we have a lot of casual labour. They, they have an entitlement to a certain amount of holiday, but they work very irregular hours, so there has to be some accommodation made from that. Automating those systems has been quite challenging and, and a lot of fun. We have situations where we have different suppliers that can provide essentially the same good, and they're always fiddling around with the prices. Can I write something which will basically scrape different websites, do a price comparison, say, well, this week you should buy from supplier A, and yeah. next week you should buy from supplier B. Um, so... They're surprisingly complex problems for a small business. There must be problems that many, many small businesses face. Mm. Um, and yet, you know, if you want an accounting package, no problem. There's yeah. no zero or any one of these problems yeah. out there, Sage. Um, if you want stuff that actually does your monthly payroll end, well, if you've got casual labour, you're, you're on your it's own. Hard, it's hard, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So um, I love it. It's fantastic. Um, it's also, you know, because I'm... I've always been on the technical side and the business side is always a little bit of a kind of weird place for me and now I'm forced much more into contact with the, the business priorities. You know, Do we want to spend time doing this? Yes mm, or no? Mm, Not just mm. is it an interesting job? Yeah. Or, uh, but actually in the summer when our trade is higher because we're a seasonal business, yep. um, can we actually afford to, to do this bit of work or should we put it off until November? Mm, so mm. all those kind of businessy decisions and commercial ones are becoming much more part of my experience now uh, alongside the technical stuff so what's your ambition for the rest of your career well one of it is to get work life balance right you know always in, in in all the big firms i've worked for for the last i don't know 20 years there's this whole you know must get your work life balance right mm. and, and obviously firms want you to err on the work side rather than the life yes. side um, yes. for all the lip service it's paid but Actually, within a small business, and this will probably resonate with a lot of your listeners, it's really, really hard to do. Within a big business, you get you know so many days leave a year. Um, 
Yeah. You, you, you can. But anyone running their own business, yeah. it's based on your results rather than the result of a team, a company, yeah. revenues or whatever. Yeah. So um, it is. So finding that balance and being able to say, right, at this point, right now, I'm going to put down work and I'm going to do something fun. Mm. That's actually quite a hard thing to do. And mm. that's in my, my first six months in this. I would say that I haven't got that balance right. Okay. Um, the next six months is going to be trying to get it right so that the work still gets done, but um, you know, other things get done alongside that. So, is that, so uh, what we haven't touched on is your writing. So you you do a a blog, um, which I can put details of the yeah. blog on the on the show notes. Um, I also understand you write a bit of fiction I do. as well. So is the is the ambition to write more or do more Alexa, which which is which would be your priority if you in the next six months? I would like to do both. Um, the writing I, I write near future science fiction, and a lot of it, you know. People would not be surprised after what I've said here, the kind of things I write about. I, I, I look at a situation sort of 70, 80, 90, 100 years' time when you know, Alexa Mark 10, let's say, mm-hmm. is there, of a level of sophistication where that could be a meaningful work partner. Yeah. Um, I don't go into kind of you know, sex bots and that kind of stuff because that, someone else can write about that. But I, I look at it in terms of having um, an artificial intelligence as a working partner. Right, um, and I will say because the, when I started writing this series, I was working very much in the financial services. A lot of it is about financial fraud, but in space. Okay. Um, okay. Which kind of you know, um, what things are different if you're, you know, on Earth, anywhere at all is within sort of about a quarter of a second if you think of a signal going around the yep. world. Okay. Now, if you've got. Um, you know, your base, let's say your, let's say the NASA's Mars lander builds up into a big Mars base. Yeah. Um, now, Mars is minimum, what, 20 minutes away, maybe 40 minutes. Um, a lot can happen in 20 to 40 minutes. Mm-hmm. So what are the kinds of financial fraud that might find avenues when all of a sudden signals are delayed again? Right. Because we're used to a situation where... With fibre optics, it's yeah. literally in less than a second yeah. and it moves. It happens yeah. quicker than you can respond to. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we see with electronic trading and automated trading um, how either well or how badly that can do, mm. happening vastly quicker than a person can respond to. Yeah. So those are the issues I look at, kind of human-AI interactions and how that will develop and uh, that sort of thing. So that's, that's going on. I'd like to do more of that. Um, blog, yeah, the blog kind of supports that. I write blogs about things that, that interest me, really. Um, there isn't any one single theme um, Sometimes I talk about ancient history, sometimes I talk about astronomy or um, rocketry, all kinds of stuff. So so just to wrap up, so if, if anyone wants to find out more about you or or interact with you, um, how would they do it? You can you can do a plug of, of your, your, your son's business in the Lake District as right, well if you yeah, want. Yeah. But the business consists of three parts. Um, there's a guest house called they're all in Grasmere, which is a, a, um, a small village pretty much bang in the geographic centre of the Lake District. Um, um, it's, it's very full of tourists at some times, so uh, if you don't like tourists, you're better off coming slightly out of season. Um, but it's a great place, love it. Um, it's close to a lot of the very, very challenging and difficult walks that you hear about, but also close to a lot of very ordinary ones. So it's the guest house. We run What's a, the guest house called? Oh, Lakeview Country House. Okay. Um, and we run a small pub slash bar called The Good Sport, which is just down the road from that, which um, um, is a lot of fun. And for the, the pub, we brew our own range of beers. So most of the beers that we sell and ales and a couple of ciders are our own. And we make that in some old farm buildings just off uh, uh, at the edge of the property. And so if they wanted to find all social media or, I, as I say, I'll put the yeah. blog. I'll put the blog. But we'll blog put post. the links on, on the show notes. It'll be easy rather than sort of me saying www. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, they'll be on the show notes. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's where to find me in a business context. And we'll put a couple of links for uh, that. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's all good stuff. Awesome. Awesome. So we're going to wrap up there. Um, I'm just going to just do a quick quick wrap up for everyone um so if this is the absolute business mindset podcast you can find this podcast on all platforms on, on where podcasts are released um i've got an active instagram and twitter account which you'll get on the show notes as well 
Um, I've just set up a Patreon account, so if anyone wants to join, and there's different tiers on there uh, that you can get different uh, different support and different uh, sort of merchandise and stuff. And obviously, there's also the YouTube video, uh, which uh, has all of my videos and uh, from quite a long time ago. If you listen to any of them, please give me a thumbs up. That would be very much appreciated. All right, guys, thank you very much for your time, and I'll speak to you soon. Thanks. Bye.